So you finally decided to join the trend and build a small form factor PC. So let's say you go with one of the best ITX cases out there, the Cooler Master NR200P with the tempered glass. So you can show off and admire your $2,000 worth of equipment but then you run into an issue cooling your i9 processor that runs at 230 watts and your RTX graphics cards that runs nearly over 220 watts as well. In this video, I will show you how you can achieve optimal and whisper quiet cooling while still being able to show off your new build with the tempered glass panel. Let's get right into it. So when I was doing research on how to best cool my NR200 case with my Intel i9-1085K running at 10 cores and of course my RTX 3070, I was disappointed with how many builds were always using liquid AIO cooling. I'm not really a big fan of liquid cooling as it's generally more expensive and it has more moving parts that could go wrong versus good old air cooling which is very simple and easy to install. Worst of all, if you do decide to go with liquid cooling in the NR200P, there's not really a perfect optimal way to show off the internals of your beautiful computer with the tempered glass, of course. For example, if you decide to mount, let's say, a 240mm AIO on the side panel, you totally block everything and it kind of defeats the whole purpose of getting a tempered glass. If you go the fancy route and decide to mount your GPU in the vertical position and then mount the AIO at the bottom, well, that is not really advised. That could cause some serious issues with your AIO's pump. And worst of all, given your graphics card's orientation, the glass panel is really going to choke the graphics card of fresh air. So for my personal taste, liquid cooling was not an option. At least not a viable option since mounting a radiator at the top was not feasible for, with this specific case. As for choosing the best CPU tower cooler, this was one of the biggest hurdles I had when trying to decide my build. I needed the biggest, most dense air cooler that was less than 155 millimeters in height so I can put on the tempered glass without any fuss. Unfortunately, most good air coolers like the Noctua U12S or U12A run just over 155 millimeters, around 158 millimeters, which could fit the mesh cover, but not the fancy glass cover. Not to mention, a lot of budget air coolers like Cooler Master Evo 212 or the Be Quiet Pier Rock 2 did not fit perfectly. Apparently, the Cooler Master Hyper T12 Black Edition fits without touching the delicate glass of your case if you unscrew the top cover of the heat pipe and remove the cosmetic protection for the pipes. Now, there was of course the gigantic Skythe Fuma 2, which there was no clear consensus of whether or not this would still fit in without any fuss without it touching the tempered glass. What makes it really hard to pick the best air cooler for your motherboard is that there's so many different factors and variations of motherboards that really affect things like the RAM clearance, the CPU socket position, and of course the dreaded tall, over, overly large IO shields on the back. The worst part about shopping for CPU coolers is that it's a really big deal to have to constantly swap in and out different air coolers because if let's say for example one didn't fit then you got to swap it out with another one so then you have to clean your CPU cooler and apply thermal paste and use alcohol cleaner and that can be a very painstaking and also kind of a risky operation because you don't want to be messing around and tinkering too much with your computer and what's really crappy is that some retailers like Canada Computers will not accept refunds for open and used computer parts. So this means that choosing the wrong CPU cooler that isn't compatible with your motherboard or your case can be a very timely and costly mistake. After days of agonizing research, I was finally gonna settle and just opt for the budget option, the Hyper 212 Black Edition, which fits the bills in terms of kind of how it fits without with the tempered glass, although it did require a little bit of a hack. But I was also a little bit concerned about the RAM clearance and how well it could actually cool a modern i9 CPU from Intel. But then a little bit later while I was shopping online, I caught a glimpse of the newer model, the Hyper 212 Evo V2. This is the version 2. Man, it doesn't really help that Cooler Master has a million variations of their budget 120mm air cooler. It's a little bit overwhelming. Anyways, despite it being a little bit more expensive and not looking as good as the Black Edition, I decided to go for the V2 version because it was guaranteed RAM clearance due to its asymmetrical design and marginally according to some reviews that the CPU thermals were allegedly better and also allegedly an easier install process. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Right off the bat, looking at the Evo V2, I immediately noticed how rough the bottom surface is. This was not a good sign, especially compared to, let's say, Noctua coolers that I've used in the past, which had a shiny, flat, nickel copper surface. That's something I dearly missed. So I installed it, and oh boy, that install process was awful. 
it was really, really tricky to kind of prepare the Intel back bracket. You had to put these clips in a specific way and it just wasn't very intuitive and the instructions weren't very helpful. It took me a very long time to figure out how to do it correctly. Maybe I'm an idiot, but this was nowhere near like kind of installing things with the Secu from, with, from Noctua, which was a lot easier. Now, as I was installing the Hyper V2 cooler, I noticed that the mounting screws were not made of pl plastic and that's a little bit concerning because because most manufacturers like Noctua for example use a plastic spacer that touches the motherboard. I much prefer to use plastic on my motherboard because it feels safer and I don't like the fact that the Evo V2 is using metal fasteners that make direct contact with the motherboard. This was overall a little bit concerning. And what was really odd was no matter how hard I tried to tighten down the hardware, it was always wobbling, it was not secure, and I couldn't just get the, the bracking mounting hardware connected to the motherboard properly. I, I tried my best and it just wasn't ever secured. But anyways, I continued with the installation. I finally mounted the actual CPU cooler on top of it. And I was hoping that that kind of, when you mount it and you screw it on, it would apply pressure onto the motherboard such that everything is secure in place. And it kind of did work, but it was, just very sketchy installation process overall. Even before using this air cooler, I was already really frustrated with this product and I was not looking forward to the results. So I installed and ran Cinebench R23 and wow, this was a terrible choice for my 10 core i9-1085K. It immediately hit 100 Celsius and thermal throttled. This was a terrible choice and I highly, highly do not recommend buying the Hyper 212 CPU cooler if you get an R200 build. Also, notice how the thermal grease is not fully spread around the entire surface area of the CPU's heat spreader. This means that there is a very poor surface contact with the heat spreader. This is a major concern, especially for 10 core CPUs like the i 9th 10th generation. And worst of all, despite what an Amazon review had said, the tempered glass does not fit. The metal heat pipes touch the glass and that is a major concern, especially when you're just you know making contact with glass all the time that could apply undue pressure. According to Cooler Master's website, the height of the CPU cooler is 155 millimeters, which should fit in theory in this case, but it was not even close. Okay, so let's recollect ourselves. The Cooler Master Evo V2 was a disaster. But in the end, after my second choice, I think I found the best air cooler that is 100% guaranteed to provide excellent RAM clearance, and most importantly, fit with the tempered glass on without any hacks, without any modification. And this CPU cooler is called the Scythe Mugen 5. Sitting at 0.5 millimeters shorter than the Evo V2, the Mugen 5 is no doubt the best bang for buck that gives you the freedom to show off all the glorious internal guts of your PC with the tempered glass without any restrictions. I have not seen one user report of this CPU cooler not fitting in the NR200P. Not, no issues with the tempered glass at all. And what's really great about the Mugen 5 is that it has six heat pipes. That is two more than the most budget options out there, like the, you know, the, the Pure Rock 2 or the Cooler Master Evo 212. And it also has a very nice shiny contact surface that it, you know, is very flat and this ensures proper thermal transfer. And it just feels like a more premium Noctua cooler. In fact, given that the heat pipes in the design, this cooler kind of best matches the Noctua U12S which I'm actually using in my Fantex 300A build, which I'll make a separate video about. Now it does come in a blacked out version, which is really nice, but you are paying a bit of higher, higher premium for that. Another nice bonus with the Mugen 5 is that it includes an amazing screwdriver, which has a magnetic tip. This magnetic tip can really help you in tough situations when you're trying to reach for a screw that has buried down into the motherboard. So honestly, if you're deciding between the Scythe Mugen 5 or let's say a more budget option like the Evo 212 or the Pierrock 2, I say definitely spend the extra $10, not only for just better thermals and better build quality, but the install process was just so good because they copied Noctua and it was such a pleasant experience to install this. I had no issues with wobbling or mounting the hardware. Everything just worked flawlessly. Now, a super nice surprise was that I was still able to mount the standard size 120 millimeter exhaust fan directly above the tower cooler. So if you look at the NR200P, it's gonna come with two fans. They're gonna be Sickle Master 120 millimeter fans that are directly bolted on to the top cover of your case. And on Reddit, I heard a lot of people have issues with this Scythe Mugen 5 and also being able to mount a fan directly above it. Now in my case, thanks to the ingenious design by Cooler Master for the NR200, there's actually these metal grills that protect the fan from any wires, any loose wires kind of just getting caught in the blade of the fan. So I was able to put the top cover with all the fans on, the two fans, 
and it was a really tight fit. You could see that it's just barely touching the CPU cooler, but I was just really impressed at how I could jam this all in, and I was very happy. Now, this, of course, is an, a function of your motherboard, the socket CPU position. If your motherboard is slightly different, you may not have as much luck as I do. So just be keep that in mind. Now, as for RAM clearance, 100% no issues. You can pretty much have the tall RGB RAM sticks if you want. If you can't mount a standard size fan just above the tower cooler, no worries, you can still use a slim fan, which is 15 millimeters in depth. However, you'll need some special kind of screws to put it onto the proprietary casing that allows for fans to be stuck onto the onto the top cover. So just keep that in mind. Now the Mugen or the Mugen, the Mugen 5 is not perfect and there are some interesting gripes that I had with this cooler. Number one, I was not able to add a second 120 millimeter fan for a push-pull configuration. Now this has nothing to do with the air cooler, but it has to do with my Gigabyte Z490i Aorus Ultra which has a really large IO shield in the black on the back, which blocks any fan from being mounted, which this, this you know, this totally sucks. And I, I really would, would love to put a second fan to get that extra performance, but I did make some reconciliation with this. I was able to mount a 92 millimeter rear fan in the back of the case. And we'll talk about how that may affect the thermal performance a little bit later. Now, the second item that I'm not too happy about this air cooler was that I was a little bit disappointed of the heatsink density. I noticed that a lot of Noctua fans have a very dense array of heat, heat, heat sink fans. So please let me know in the comments if this is a legit concern. And number three, the last downside I had for this particular Mugen 5 cooler is that the included 120 millimeter fan, which is a Scythe Kazi fan, is mediocre at best in terms of its performance. I was really, really shocked that it can only go up to 1200 RPMs, which definitely severely bottlenecks the cooling performance of the CPU cooler. And above 950 RPMs, it gets really loud. It's, it is very, very obvious. I've actually swapped this out for the you know pristine Noctua A12 120mm fan. And I used this uh, Scythe Mugen 5 fan as a case fan at the bottom, as you can see here in this video. And I was really shocked at how loud it is above 900 RPMs. I couldn't believe it. I actually thought it was my other Noctua fan, the F12 fan next to it. <laughs> so maybe I have a defective unit. It was weird because when it was mounted on the CPU cooler, the Sky fan didn't seem that loud, but it seems much louder as a case fan. I don't know. So let me know in the comment section if you have any issues with the fan. So all these things can be addressed. The first thing is that I re immediately replaced the stock fan that came with the Scythe Mugen 5. And I obviously said, like I said before, I replaced it with the infamous Noctua A12, the, the, the most premium, most expensive fan you can buy ever. And I of course bought the Noctua A9, which is a little bit more modest, but it's a much smaller fan at 92 millimeters. And I attached it at the rear case. This hopefully will help with the thermal performance in a kind of a somewhat push-pull configuration. I just want to make a quick note about the Noctua A12. I did a lot of extensive testing with this fan, and I'm just honestly so impressed of how quiet the fan operation is for its RPM. This means that this is the most efficient fan when it comes to thermals and noise operation. So if you have the budget, this is definitely going to be a lot better than the shockingly bad stock fan, the Scythe Kazi 120mm fan that comes with the air cooler that you buy. Now, before we get into the results, let's talk about case fans and fan orientation because this is very important to the NR200P. Now, the NR200 is unlike any other ATX case you probably dealt with. It has a very special type of cooling configuration that, you know, is going to be optimal. Typically, in any case, you generally have the CPU cooler exhaust or push air to the rear of the case, such as, as you can see in this Dell G5 or my other recent builds with with the Fantech 300A, which is also a very nice budget case. Those cases have a front intake fan drawing in a lot of cool air to help cool down the tower cooler. However, with the NR200P, the front panel is completely sealed off. Now this was really counterintuitive to me, but I believe the optimal fan configuration is to draw cool ambient air from the rear of the case. This, the rear is gonna act as an intake and you're gonna exhaust into the case, but out the case from the top fans. This is especially important if you have any 3000 RTX card where there's a two-way exhaust. Now, for example, if you look at my Founder Edition and the Gigabyte Aorus 3070 that I have, both have a rear exhaust that shoot up into the case. Now, imagine the CPU cooler drawing in that hot air 24 seven from the rear exhaust of your GPU. This is not ideal. Instead, you wanna feed your CPU tower cooler really nice, cool, fresh air as soon as possible, and that's gonna be from the back in this case. 
Now, one minor detail I want to add is that most graphics cards has an exhaust, a rear exhaust that shoots out in the back of your case. And this could potentially be an issue for the, you know, the rear intake for your CPU tower cooler. But I, I, I don't think it's a real issue unless you have the case super close up to the wall, because as soon as that air kind of exhaust out, it kind of just dissipates and it kind of just dies from its hotness down into a cooler air. So you're not, you're not going to risk the, the, the kind of the GPU cooler exhausting hot air and then recycling it back into the uh, CPU tower cooler. I don't think that's going to happen, at least not from my experiments. Okay, so finally, let's talk about the results. We finally get to the end. The Scythe Mugen 5 just absolutely destroys the Cooler Master Evo V2 when running Cinebench R23. With all the 10 cores maxed out at 4.7 GHz, it's no competition, and there's no point even showing the numbers. Where it gets more interesting is between the stock configuration of the Mugen 5 versus adding in that you know 92mm rear intake fan and swapping out the severely limited RPM Kazi fan for the beastly Noctua A12 120mm fan. So running the same test bench, in the stock configuration, with only one 120 millimeter fan in the pool configuration, it hit 98 Celsius in just about under two minutes, one minute and 55, 57 seconds. Now, adding that Noctua A9 fan in the rear intake and adding that beastly A12 for the push-pull configuration, the benchmark never went over 95 Celsius for a much longer duration. So this is substantially better than the stock configuration, obviously. Now, yes, yes, you might be screaming in the comments. The, the A12 max RPM is 2000. So of course it's gonna run a lot better than the you know 1200 Kaze 120 miller fan, which is, you know, it's substantially faster than the stock fan. But here's the thing, the A12 is so quiet. It, it's gonna run maybe even 1500 RPMs and it's gonna be about, you know, the same loudness as the Kaze fan. So, you know, you can't compare the RPMs and then also look at the noise levels. It's performing a lot quieter for more RPMs and more airflow. This really goes to show that adding that extra fan, let's say the, the rear intake and then adding a much better fan, you're going to get a much better investment overall. So you might be wondering, why should I buy the Mugen 5 and then replace the case fans with more expensive Noctua fans where I could just buy the Noctua U12A, which comes with two you know, A12 fans in the push-pull configuration? Well, if you do end up buying that, yes, that is going to be a substantially or a slightly better heatsink because it comes with, I believe, seven heat pipes instead of six. It's gonna cost a lot more overall, and you might not even fit the, the two fans get, you know, based on your motherboard's IO shield. And of course, you're not gonna be able to fit the tempered glass. So I don't recommend that. I, re I recommend just getting the Mugen 5 and then just buying a Noctua A12 fans separately and then using that Scythe fan maybe as a you know, a case fan at the bottom, even though it's pretty loud. Speaking of case fans, I highly, highly recommend investing in two bottom uh, case fans of the size of 120 millimeters. They definitely make a big difference, especially for GPU temperatures. In fact, you probably want the smallest GPU you can fit because it really helps kind of not obstruct the airflow. In my case, I have the RTX 3070 Founders Edition, which is such a great card because it's so small. It doesn't try to be really big, but it's just so performant. It just performs so well. It's so quiet compared to, let's say, for example, my really loud, bulky Gigabyte Aorus Master 3070, which was a terrible card that I had to was forced to buy from Canada Computers because of the scalpers. And I still kind of got scalped from Canada Computers because I was forced to buy it with an overpriced Z590 motherboard. And so, yeah, if you end up getting like, say, <laughs> that's a whole separate story, by the way. But if you do end up getting a much thicker card that, you know, goes up to three uh, case slots, then you'll definitely have to get slim fans, which is unfortunate. Now for the two top exhaust fans, I'm super grateful that Cooler Master included two uh, sickle flow 120 millimeter fans as stock. They're not bad, you know, over a thousand RPMs, they get a little bit loud and annoying. So just keep them kind of 950 RPMs. And that ingenious design by uh, Cooler Master with the NR200 by putting the metal grate filters over those top exhaust fans so you could barely just stick all those fans right above the tower cooler and above the power supply, amazing. Now your, your mileage may vary depending on that situation, but it's a very ingenious case design so far. So in conclusion, the Scythe Mugen 5 is the best bang for buck air cooler that allows you to, you know, allows you to display your pride and joy without any restrictions. I'm talking about the tempered glass. However, if you're going down that route, I highly advise you to replace the stock fan with the Noctua A12 and then just adding a rear intake fan. Any kind of 92 millimeter will do. Point the CPU fans as a rear intake position, especially if you have a rear exhausting graphics card like the Founders Edition for the RTX 3070s. And invest in some decent bottom intake fans to keep your GPU nice and cool, especially when it's idle. 
By the way, when the GPU is idle, you notice that there's all these heat sinks being exposed. Well, you're having those bottom intake fans keeping it cool. So just really nice to have, you know, a really cool graphics card all the time. Anyways, that's all for this video. Please let me know in the comment section down below, is my case fan configuration optimal? Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Is your setup better? I would love to know. And if there's a better CPU tower cooler that fits with this tempered glass, definitely let me know. Anyways, that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.